Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigus. Tim Pottage is equally at home casting flies for chub, barbel, bass, and mullet, and even sometimes some trout too. He's a contributor to Fly Culture, makes fishing films on YouTube, and you might recognize him by his social media handle, The Fly Fishing Londoner. We'll be talking about fishing, filmmaking, and course fish on the fly too. Tim, it's great to have you along on the Fly Culture Podcast. How are you doing today? Oh, good. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I managed to get it and uh, managed to arrange suitable time. I don't know what, it must be, I think, a month almost of planning to do this. But yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's great to have you along. And like you say, I know we've been tying this I've oh, been trying to tie this up for a little while now, and I'm really pleased that we have. I guess you've got busy family life, work, and, of course, fishing. And while we're on the fishing theme, which we will <laughs> remain on, of course, have you been yeah. doing much? It looks as though from your social media you've been super busy catching all sorts of wonderful fish all over the place. Well, mostly mullet for the past um, month or something like that, just trying to find places in around London. I mean, Petrol prices are ridiculous at the moment, and that's kind of curtailed what I had planned originally, which is to try and find some populations of thick lips somewhere in North Kent, which is not that difficult for me to get to. But yeah, I've just been scouting places in London, uh, the Thames, some of the, the, the creeks that come off it, um, from sort of uh, early April until May. I was doing some trout fishing. It's, it's kind of how the how my fishing's pla- uh, um, settling into all the pattern my fly fishing settling into anyway trout april to may mullets in the summer and then the winter i'll be on some of the um some of the small streams that we have around in southeast london for chub and they have jack pike in them as well so that's kind of yeah the and of my fishing overall but what i've also been doing recently Right. And you talked about the petrol prices and, of course, you know, it's hitting home with all yeah, this. And I know, yeah. know you had a spell of not having a car at all. And, you know, you've talked about the streams around South London that I guess yeah. were easier to get to. Did that mean at that time you had to plan your day a lot more carefully then to, to get to your fishing? And I think the piece you wrote for us about mullet as well, you didn't didn't even have a car then, did you? You managed to find some No, mullet? no. So I started fly fishing in 2011. Um, before that, I was a carp angler. Uh, I got my first car in 2016. I mean, in those y- years, uh, the, p- the pattern was I'd get into fly fishing for a couple of years and then back into carp and then fly. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so I wolf and so I used to just get – that was, a, you know, the first place I fly fished. So I would just get the, the train there Um then on Wandle, and then I did a few um, uh, a few sessions on some of the free stretches of rivers that we have, even the Itchin, um, that you can get to a couple of hours on, by train from Waterloo. Um, yes, I mean, it used to get a bit ridiculous when I was saltwater, fl- when I first got into saltwater fly fishing, because I was uh, I went to Hayling Island, which is a long old slog from southeast London on the train, you know. And it's, it's not like London where you can get a bus 24-7. You know, there's one bus, there's, you know, two buses, but they finish at like half past nine. So, yeah, I was leaving early in the morning, four in the morning, what, even earlier, night bus down to Waterloo, two-hour train ride, then a bus service down. And, you know, when I finally got to Coha, obviously that, that opened up a whole world of things. But the funny thing is a lot of my local fishing now is done, even though I have a car. Or, or I've found those places um, uh, since I've had a car. You know, the, the closer somewhere it is, the quicker I can be there. It saves time. You know, I can be fishing there. It, if something's an hour away, you know, versus half an hour away, you know, that's an hour more fishing time. That's a bit less cost in terms of fuel. Um, yeah, but, I, you know, I, I prefer local, really, and that's the what I try and do well it's what leads me to do multi-species rather than I guess the default which would be trout you know in a way yeah absolutely and it's interesting to um 
hear about how you plan your your fishing as well and and how you keep it close to home as well and i even myself you know there's loads of trout streams where i live and obviously i'm mainly trout focus but i found even the other day some rain came in and i just went to my home water instead of making a drive that wasn't a horrific drive to get to but there's also that familiarity isn't there and there's that home water sort of pool that's quite a strong one do you do you find that yourself i don't i don't think i have anyone particular any place i could call a home water really um no not really i fish i think what it is is um maybe it's some kind of a disorder i just like to do new things try new things a lot um so yeah i just like one season, I think, all right, I'd like to try and catch X, Y, Z on a fly. And, yeah, first place I'll look is locally. I mean, so let's just say theoretically I wanted to catch a sea trout from London. I mean, it, if you keep in touch with the right people, it's doable. You know, if you were to spend two years or something, I mean, it's a long, it's a long old slog, but you, you, it's, 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 it's doable. You, you surprise what you'll find in London and, you know, underneath your underneath your nose really so i end up doing lots of research on places talking to lots of anglers um talking to lure anglers for example because obviously water clarity for them is just as much as an issue as for us so um, yeah that's how i sort of find the places and yeah um like i say it's just i don't spend the whole day fishing i'll try and fish as much as possible which averages two days a week maybe three but it'll always be a half day never really a whole day a whole day will be a treat really you know i've got children um uh so i mean i probably do spend a bit too much time fishing to be honest with you but i think it's 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 part of my life and it's it's an obsession you know yeah i think many people listening will probably feel the same way as well it's interesting what you said about the sea trout and um, you talk about the streams around South London, and we're, we're not going to mention any of those right now. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, that that process of finding has Google Earth been useful to you? Do you find that's a, a, a useful way of, of searching out water? I mean, yeah, Google Earth, Google's. I mean. I mean, the, the mobile phone is the is the, probably the greatest tool now for well. I mean, the mobile phone with the internet or the internet in general is the greatest tool for learning ever. I mean, it's incredible what you can find. You can teach yourself to do from scratch. I mean, that's how I learned to fly cast mostly, just YouTube videos and things like that. Um, yeah, so I just if, if so, if take for example when I wanted to catch a carp on the fly. I'm a carp. I was a carp angler originally, so I know roughly places that have clear water. Um, I don't know what's in them, how difficult they're likely to be. So it's just a case of, I don't know, just the process of elimination and then going down and actually giving it a go. I mean, you can't substitute anything really for actually just getting getting out there and doing it and putting in the time. The time. And I think certainly if all of the disciplines are kind of established dis- disciplines that mirror a lot of my fishing, I would say it would be salt water. If you're new to salt water and you haven't got somebody to guide you, then it's very much about you having to get out there and discover the marks and, you know, learning when they fit, you know, uh, what stage of the tide they fish in. You know, you, you really have to put in some effort, you know, especially if no one's giving you, uh, the, the, giving you the information. I think trout, for me, is a bit more of an open book. You have 150 years' worth of protocol that's being laid down. That's not to say it's easy. I mean, you've still got people who are, fishing for isolated, you know, unique populations of trout, you know, who, who are you know, looking at stocking records dating back to the Victorian era and then driving up into the mountains and remote places. So there's still that element of the unexplored with trout fishing, but I think a lot more of it is, is just more established than the other disciplines. And I suppose maybe that's the reason why I like, I don't like, it's a carp fishing mentality, I think. I don't like competition or being around too many other anglers. So I like to try and sort of, find places that are a bit more off the beaten path so I can be by myself or not with not in direct competition with other anglers. I mean fly anglers, not not you know, I'm happy to be around bait anglers or whatever or the lure angler. 
Yeah, so I guess that's the ethos behind what I do, really. Yeah, it's interesting. You're, you've yeah. got a foot in so many camps, and, you know, what you were saying about salt water that, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't, I'm sure many people listening will know this as well, that marks are very tightly held by um, saltwater anglers, particularly bass, and I understand the reasons for that as well. Trout, like you say, I think is probably a little bit more of an open book, although, you know, we all have a favourite trout stream tucked in our pocket that we might write down the details of and hand to somebody, but that's about it. And then the course side, I, I, I guess, is completely different again, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's... There, for me, like the gold standard, it would be Skateboard Dave, who's definitely somebody you need to have on. I mean, the stuff he does is completely out there, like catching some, I don't know, like going out in a kayak and catching, like, I don't know, a board of deep water species on a fly rod, you know? Like, I don't know what it was. It's some weird ribbon fish. He's the gold standard, really, as far as, like, what I like doing anyway, which is off the beaten track, fishing the different species and just, yeah, just it constant constantly experiencing new things as well and uh, something i think i i mentioned uh, i've written two articles for uh, fly culture and i was listening to the radio once and it was talking about um you know how you perceive time the older you get you know and it's obviously the older you get the fast faster time goes and the reason well one person gave behind it uh, was um that you experience new things a lot less the older you get so everything's more routine. I mean, whereas if you're a two-year-old, think of the amount of new things you encounter every day. You know, then it kind of helps almost slow down the pace of time. Um, and I guess maybe that's kind of the way I do things with my fly fishing. You know? And there is a downside to it because, you know, being a master of, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, you never get truly good at anything, really. You know, um, not like... If you think about someone like Paul Proctor, what he is to like a you know wild brown trout or whatever, you know somebody who's a real master, at, you know a smaller amount of things. And then you know when I filmed Duncan, he said you can approach something, do you know fly fishing a couple of ways. You can seek to experience multiple different things, multiple dis, uh, different species, or you can um, seek to I don't know. Uh, get joy in fishing similar water in different ways, you know, and it, it's like trout fishing. There's so many little tiers of ref refinement that you can make, you know, even on the same stream, the same, uh, same conditions, different days, you know, it's, I find the trout, it's funny because dry fly in a way, it's very simple. Fish shows you where, where it is, but in a way there's a level of complexity within that, that simpleness as well so yeah you can do things so many different ways you know and enjoy your sport so many different ways um yeah yeah i think that's what keeps me coming back is that there's always something new there's always i've learned something if my discipline is focused more on trout yeah i get something from each day and no yeah. um two days are the same anyway you know you suddenly think this isn't going to be very good and it turns out okay or whatever it may be and then you know the dry fly thing i think a guest i had on eight or summed it perfectly he said i just like seeing the fly on the surface of the water and a fish coming up and eating it yeah and i think that for me captured it perfectly why i like it because mm -hmm. you can go down that elitist stroke slash snobby thing and it's not and i i certainly wouldn't consider myself one of those i just think it's fun way to fish and i really enjoy it from that point of view so yeah. you know that is that that mixed sort of um approach that we can have that keeps I us mean, going. I, go on sorry tim well that's the way my trout fishing went this year anyway i mean bear in mind over the since i've gone to fly fishing i've never spent a hard you know season just fishing for trout but this year, that was a massive change. I've been going more towards just enjoying pure dry fly, for, fly fishing. And, that you know, I had a, a day on the model where I had two rods. I thought I'd try out a bit of nymphing in one stretch. And, yeah, I saw a fish rising for a drive. More, more of a fairly competent dry fly, fly angler. But the big change was patience. I mean, you know, maybe last year I could sit there for maybe five, ten minutes. Now I find, you know, that the time is that I'm – prepared to wait for a rising fish if it's not rising frequently is getting longer and longer so yeah as far as the trout 
this year go, is going on. Yeah, I'm definitely be going more towards the dry fly fishing. And I suppose there is something um, there is something very special about casting a dry fly to a rising trout. You know, it's 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 a core fundamental of our sport, really. And I'm not saying you know you don't have to be have to have uh, caught a trout for it to validate your fishing, but there's definitely something very special about walking in the footsteps of, uh, of the greatest of the sport. You know, and I'm not, not I'm not a historian by any means, but yeah, I do really enjoy the trout, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was succinctly and beautifully put as well. And and yeah, it's it's just fun, and I I just still really get a kick out of it i'm starting to think not quite the same way as yourself but mm. you know june's oh mid-june's not round far around the corner now and you know i'll, I'll try and catch a grayling yeah. perhaps around the 16th and that'll be fun and if i can find one rising that would be even cooler as well so i'm looking forward to that yeah. i wanted to rewind a little bit because you talked a little bit about the way that you um yeah. approach your fishing and how you actually look come from a course fishing background yeah. and how um you mentioned carp there and you mentioned yeah. going after them with a dry fly uh with in clear water sorry does that mean yes, that you're yeah. stalking them um always and, yeah yeah and how are you going about oh. doing that where you're stalking them um, so basically, I mean, this is something that Corsica and Dave has, you know, if you've ever read an article by, by of his, which of course you have, you know, you've got two camps in fly fishing. You've got the side in this country where it's really floater fishing, going to a commercial water, catapulting um, biscuits out. And then you've got the other side, which is more what you see in other parts of the world where people are fishing for feral populations, we've got Australia, South Africa, Canada, the, the US, and it's more imitative. You're fishing natural patterns. But, I mean, it, it, the carp is very simple. They're, they're not easy, but the, the method to catch them is simple. All you do is just find a carp, find, find a bunch of them, preferably moving but very slowly or feeding, cast ahead of them, drag the fly back in their path, let it sink very slowly. And, um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is something I'm actually having very strong feelings about because – I enjoy when I was a carp angler. I tended to fish places that were on the harder end, end of the scale. You know, no, not the mega hard places where, from I don't know March to November, you can count the amount of fish you catch with one hand. You know, um, but I would still I would prefer that. But within the carp thing, I think there are lots of questions that, that I think we need to ask ourselves, particularly with regards to some of these commercials people fishing. I mean, I'm, I've seen some photos that are quite frankly horrific. Of, carp with literally no mouths you know that's not that's not my idea if, if that's my that's the kind of place that should be outlawed as far as i'm concerned um you know they're not easy you know, to in the first place carp you know and um that's part of the enjoyment of it it's what makes um carp fishing traditionally as well it's so rewarding you, you you know you're prepared to have those blanks to get that one fish you know and there are some places that are so hard that you can literally, you know, we're going back to traditional carp angling, you might catch one fish a year. And that just that one capture will mean so much to you. So for me, I, I think more people should start to adopt sort of um, Corsica Dave's attitude, trying to go to the more low stock place, or even places that you have wild carp in that have been here for a thousand years. Um, something that I've had I have very strong feelings on. But yeah, it's just drag and drop. They're, they're very, they're pretty. The technique's pretty straightforward to catch carp. You know? Yeah, very good. The reason yeah. I asked that, my ears pricked up when you said clear water, and obviously you know I no, know. No, you sorry, you sorry. I'm, no, I'm no, it was perfect. No, well, you answered it perfectly. <laughs> what I wanted was that um, I was thinking of Dave when you mentioned clear water, and I was thinking, I wonder how he catches them. And with Dave in mind, who's obviously been a guest on here as well. Yeah. And that was that was yeah. wonderful to hear. And, you know, it, it, I, I think for me, I, I haven't done it for a little bit, I'll, I'll be honest with you, but that, to me, stalking the fish, I think that's one of the reasons I love using a fly rod because that stalking element of them. And like you say, mm. even if it's spotting those carp moving through – but, yes, I had Dave in mind when I asked that question, and it was wonderful, A, he cropped up in the in the conversation as somebody who has pushed that 
um, side of it so, so yes. hard. And I met up with him recently, actually, in Scotland, and he was just back from Spain and had a wonderful trip there, um, catching some fish and meeting people and, and spreading the word um, about carp fishing. Mm. And do you find that hard to find clear water um, carp fisheries to – do you sort of circle it, around it, one or two or do you search it, around? Um, it, it, the, so I've done time on the River Wandle. I did a winter, and the water's always clear there. Um, and funny enough, if we go back to um, Dave, I remember he mentioned – I'm not going to go into too much detail about the location, but he mentioned a particular landscape and wild carp, and I did a Google about of it. And I managed to find you know, the most, considering where it is, it just feels really remote. And the water is coloured, but on a sunny day, they're, they're pretty high up. So you can fish coloured water as long as, long as you can see the fish move to the fly. Um, I wasn't always seeing them suck inhaler fly, but you'd see the move, you know, the movement and then inch, strike off intuition. Um, I would say for anyone um, listening to this who's who's who live somewhere where there are canals, public parks, and who are interested, just, just go down and give it a go. Um, bread fly is a good one as well. I mean, once again, I don't bait up with anything, but if, if uh, on public parks I've found, particularly where there's lots of bread being thrown in, just a single white fly sometimes does it, you know. Um, yeah, just, just walk around. You have to see the fish. You can never fish blind with carp. And, yeah, just, just flick it in front. But... There is a sort of one peculiarity that we have in the UK, and that is angling pressure. You know, carp are the most popular species to fish for now in England and much of Wales. So, yeah, they, they can be quite cagey. I mean, apparently they have one of, the, one of the bigger brains of freshwater fish and are able to figure things out in a way that a lot of other species aren't. So angling pressure is one of the, um, one of the things that definitely makes even do, doing a more natural approach a bit harder in the UK. So typically you're going to have to find places that aren't always that pre- pressured. I mean, in London we have canals. Uh, I mean, that has led me to do a couple of naughty things. I fish, fish a couple of places you're not technically allowed to, you know. <laughs> I'll just go there really early in the morning or something like that or set myself a rule that if I got challenged by members of the public three occasions, then I'll, I wouldn't go again. But, yeah. Uh, once again, it'll, it'll just give... The information on how to catch them is all there. It's just the location. You don't need crystal clear water. You just need to be able to see them. But if it's in coloured water, that probably means on a really hot day. Yeah, yeah, got you. And in some of these more public places, do you get strange comments from people when you're throwing a, a fly rod around? Uh, not really. I mean, I've had a couple of videos. Oh, there's no trout in here, you know. Um, but no, um, people are always pretty curious. I mean, this is something Damon mentioned in his podcast with you. It's like, you know, you can be anyone in London. No one's really going to turn around and, you know, look at you funny. You know, if you're walking through the centre of town in a pair of waders or something. But, yeah, usually people are quite inquisitive. Or you always get the person who does fly fishing themselves, you know. Um yeah, I think it's sometimes it's a point of curiosity. I mean, yeah, then again, I'm a black person fly fishing. I mean, that, for fishing, I mean, that in itself can be a point of curiosity for a lot of people. Not in a bad way, just because I don't see many black people fishing. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the urban places, it's, they can be quite entertaining, you know, just people you meet, the conversations you can strike up, or the, the, there's one that a lot of anyone who's fished in a public park will get you land a fish and somebody comes out with the oh did you did you catch that from here what was that in here you know people are always really surprised what, um that are there any life in some of these waterways as well as if how uh, this they're expecting everything to be ecologically dead in london you know it's really alive you know you can go down to the thames now and see seals i mean the, the article that i wrote for you uh, um I remember as I was coming down onto the foreshore, I saw a, there was a seal hunting mullet. I was just watching them jump out and then the seal surface. And it, don't ask me how the hell this happened, but it probably didn't sense me. You know, I'm assuming a lot of their hunting strategy is vibration. It was literally there. I could have t- tapped it with a rod tip. I could see the big bust underneath the surface. Yeah, L- London is alive. So I think that, yeah, people are... 
in the places where people are see the anglers, there's there's nothing really for people. You know, yeah, but. yeah. And do you think then, because we know the state of yeah. sewage discharge and everything else, but we've got this background of stories of salmon running the Thames again, and you've alluded yes. to sea trout as well. Yeah. Do you think that we have seen, and the, and the wandle that you've mentioned is a, a great case of an example, do you think yeah. there has been a tiny improvement um, since let's say the seventies, eighties, nineties, and then we've yeah. seen these cleanup groups and everything else. There is still a lot of shit being thrown into the river that is not helping and needs to be sorted out. Let's get that straight. But do you think yes. yet there has been a, a minuscule improvement that has allowed fish to improve a little bit? Have you detected that in the time you've been visiting these sort of urban streams around London? Um, I mean, uh, bear in mind I've fished them for the, for about ten years on and off. So I, you know, I don't have a massive sort of baseline to work from. But once again, there are some things that are surprising. I always thought that I always had this impression that Thames was pretty much dead in the sixties and seventies and even into the eighties. But a friend, you know, when I was trying to find places to catch mullet, he sent me a photo of a thick lip he caught in the eighties. I had people talking about catching these things in the mullet in the 60s and the 70s i mean there definitely has been a massive improvement probably since the uh, since the water companies were privatized and um, we were then also uh, subject to eu legislation on water quality you know sewage treatment regulation so yeah that, there's definitely been an improvement and then you look let's say what's happened with the wandle as well that's a massive conservation success story um so there is a big big improvement but as you're probably aware the unfortunate thing is it seems like we've come this far but then it's not you know the government basically allowing increasing amounts of discharge of course it has all last year i mean you know it's um, i don't know i guess it's a yes and no question really and it's the things we don't see as well. Um, we always think about sewage discharge in terms of nitrates and phosphates, but we don't screen for um, often for endocrine disruptors. You know, so for example, if 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 a woman's taking the contraceptive pill, um, goes to the toilet, urinates, that that contains hormones, and you know, there's quite substantial research now that shows even that's having effects on you know. Uh, I mean, they didn't want a survey on the River Lee. I mean, I, I study them, um, environmental science. So I read one paper that they found above the sewage treatment works, or well, below the sewage treatment works, so the male roach was sign, showing signs of um, part feminization. So it's like sometimes the more we know that, yeah, I guess sometimes the more we know, the, the more we have to do as well. Yeah, well, yeah it, should, it doesn't really seem like there's, there's a p- political will, or, and we we would all have to um, accept some kind of an effect on our standard of living as well. You know, water prices going up, which I'd be prepared to pay for. But I don't have a great baseline to work from. But yeah, I guess the the environments are improving steadily. But it remains to see. Have we? Have we sort of peaks at the moment just because of what we're prepared to do and prepared to tolerate in our own lives? I don't know. Yeah, and it may be, like you say, the papers that you're reading, we're, we're better informed than we were. And, you know, we know the Wandle was actually designated a open sewer, I think, mm-hmm. at one stage, wasn't it, many, many years ago. Yes. But, yes, we've got... A, yeah, and I was kind of thinking about, you know, these urban streams. I was thinking when you talked about um, the the fish there being affected by the hormones, how amazingly resilient they are. And then we think about, you know, sea trout are still trying to run some of these little streams around London and other industrial areas they're, as well. 
how incredibly resilient. And also, we're, we're, we're kind of more in touch with urban streams as well, uh, primarily led by Theo Pike, you know, and, and the book that yes. he wrote a number of years ago, that we're engaged with those a little bit more. So we know a little bit more about what's going on in these streams where we may have, and people like yourself, you know, are fishing these places and going, hey, I'm catching some fish in here. So we're sort of being helped along by people like Theo, like yourself, Damon, Tom Clinton. There's others who are fishing these urban streams that are catching these fish and we're saying actually yeah. we didn't think they were worth exploring but you guys are out there doing it and you're actually finding fish and and in some cases you're 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 surprised by the results as well aren't you yeah i mean last a couple of years ago somebody caught salmon from one of the chalk streams one of the lesser known ones in south east london but not not on the fly you go into the docks and canary wharf you've got quite a lot of sea trout in there i mean i t- i was doing a bit of I fished them on and off these docks. Now they got Xander in them as well, some cracking perch. And the guy was, you know, I've spoken to quite a few lure, lure anglers. Some of them have caught sea trout. Quite a few of them had, that's what I was saying to you, you know, it would be quite realistic if you wanted to spend, you'd have to wait for a while, but enough of them get caught there because the docks are still connected to the Thames. I mean, the connect, the it's what they let in and out. Is they're known they're not commercial ships. They're just, uh, just pleasure boats, I guess. But every time they open, they let fish out, but also let fish in. So you've got bass in these docks. You've got mullets. So, yeah, I mean, they're thriving. There are some big ones. I mean, if you do some research, Google, you can see pictures. I mean, on vi- on videos, on YouTube, you can, you can see someone landing a, a, a sea trout from one of the docks. Um, I don't know how far up they run, but you've got to think that the Thames has loads of true tributaries with trout um river wise is, is one of them berkshire Y. so yeah i mean the river's improved obviously enough for them to to be running i don't know what the annual, annual number would be but yeah they're there and once again a quick quick google you, you know you've gone to sea forums people talk about occasionally catching a salmon so yeah it's it's really surprising what you find you know what you, shad Somebody told was telling me a story. Um, funny enough, he's someone who gave me a good mullet spot on the Thames. He said some kid came up to him and said he was fishing a place um, quite in London, actually, as well. And he was saying that uh, pers- the person said that they were catching, I don't know, a dace or something, obviously an inexperienced angler. And him and his friend went down and they were catching shad, you know, in, in full sight of some of the, you know, iconic London landmarks. So, yes. We have all, almost everything you could want in the, in the city as far as fishing goes, just not necessarily the conditions that will make it easy for a flying glove. But, but yeah, it's fantastic here, yeah, really. And um, as far as you know, conservation goes, I mean, it's one thing that possibly could be pushed a bit harder. But, yeah, you know, certainly anglers have been one of the major driving factors in, in, in restoration as well. And I think it's not, we're not always given the credit. And I'll definitely have to say fly anglers coming from a carp fishing background, the depth of all the fly community is definitely probably way ahead of most other sections of the, uh, of, of, of the fishing community as far as conservation goes, I guess, because trout, you know, is still the, the dominant species or salmon it's on. They need good water quality. You know? And it's remarkable to see what companies say like Orbis or, um, Patagonia are doing, pledging some of their funds towards conservation. You know, yeah, it's one reason I do, you know, I'm permanent carp fly fisher now rather than, you know, well, well I don't carp fish now, I've sold off my gear. But, yeah. What made you sell off your gear then? Was that just simply that the fly rod was, you suddenly sort of, it clicked for you and you suddenly thought, this is well, for me, this is no, how I'd... I want to pursue fish? Well, this is what I was surprised about when I first started. Because um, fly fishing wasn't alien to me when I was growing up. My, my grandmother got a scholarship to cut study. She was from Mauritius originally. So she came over to study in uh, St. Andrews. So my father spent his life, well, dotted around because of teaching jobs. They went to Ghana for a bit, then to Northern Ireland, then to the Highlands of Scotland. And yeah, so not much to do out there. So my dad was did a bit of fishing. 
and my uncle he used to fish as well. He used to tie flies. So I've got materials here that they, you know, probably 50 years old. Um, he never really fly fished at all, but it wasn't alien to me, you know, because the materials were in the house. And um, that was, you know, the first fish I ever caught was a brown trout on a worm. And, um, but, so, but even then, you know, I was, uh, in terms of the fishing I was doing in London, it was just course fishing. I always had this preconception of fly anglers being like, you know, just stereotypical posh, blah, 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 you know. That's how, that was the perception that, you know, it even still holds outside of the discipline as well. But when I went on to Waltham, so I was surprised, just, just the range of people who I'd see, Asian people, there are black members, there's one mixed race, black black mixed race guy called Earl who's been fishing since the 70s. Yeah, and I was really shocked, like almost, you know, there were Asians from different, you know, Muslim Asians, Hindu probably Sikhs, you know, just seeing the, the sheer range of people and there was a guy who called um, Alvin Dedo, who's an African American guide in Texas. Just seeing the diversity of people, you know, and the big game changer for me was, you know, when that Derek Chauvin stuck his neck on Floyd, or stuck, stuck his knee on George Floyd, George Floyd's and uh, George Floyd's neck and killed him, and the the aftermath, and to see some of the Fly fishing companies react to that. You know, all this puts out a big statement on diversity. And look at the history of the sport. Consider where it, where it's come from and to look at where it is now. You know, um, to see a company prepared to put their sales on the line like that. But, you know, when you when I looked at some of the comments, hey, I know now there are people who are going to listen to this now and think, oh, it's getting woke and all of this kind of crap. But to see that, you know, that was speaking to me at that point, you know, um, not just that, other companies as well, Sage, Vision UK, they all they all did very, you know, all the small gestures around that time as well. And I thought, you know, that means a lot to me, you know. Um, carp fishing, I mean, carp fishing is brilliant, but I would go onto a lake, I would get chatting to anglers, get added to Facebook, and then every once in a while... And I'm not saying that fly fishing is free from it. I get subjected to somebody's, I don't know, far right leanings. And I've seen, you know, even top name cast anglers post some pretty horrific stuff. So around this whole time as well, George Floyd there was radio silence from, from the carp scene. And I thought, I really love fly fishing. I'm getting to a level in it that, you know, I haven't done within, within carp fishing. It suits my lifestyle more. And just look at what the companies are doing. And so I'm sort of slowly starting to sell off the carp kit. And I don't I only have a couple of bits now, but there's just so much to fly fishing, so many different species, the people who I meet along the way, you know, there are so it's just just been a yeah, it's 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 all I want to do now, you know. I have ideas maybe that I'd like to pick up a lure rod, but no, I'm just a, I just love fly fishing. Even if I can't get to the water, I can take the rods out to the park and or the rod out to the park and do a bit of casting practice, you know? Um, it was just, yeah. Or I could tie some flies. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what I am now. It's all I want to do, really. Nice, nice. And I'm sorry you've had to be subjected to that. I think of fishing, we're all brothers and sisters, aren't we, of the angle we all fish, and it and, and I, I always say fishing is a microcosm of life. And yes, you'll get assholes in it. You'll get generally good people, won't you? As a whole, and it, it made me think about Walthamstow and what you said there. And that's a perfect what you described the scene that you would see there is a perfect microcosm of London life, isn't it? Yet under a fly fishing banner. I mean. There is, you know, I mean, one thing I wouldn't mind doing is setting up some kind of a project to get people from, because, you know, it doesn't matter what colour you are, you know, in a city area, there's a certain, you have a particular, yeah, to get amongst young people, there's a city culture, and a lot of people from city culture don't always experience the countryside and rural areas or what it's like to be in nature, especially, I think, if you look at a lot of people from minorities, 
a lot of us, our families came from the countryside. You know, they went fishing. I mean, it was obviously a bit would be a bit different. Be more people not fishing so much for just pure recreation as an element that you do it there to eat whatever. Well, when people came to this country, especially in the Windrush area, you know, you had to stick together. You know, it wouldn't have been you wouldn't have had the most pleasant time if you went to the countryside. So there's now this disconnect, and this is a there's this woman called Beth Collier who wrote a really great article about it. So there is a real big disconnect between a lot of people, especially people from minorities in the countryside. And it's not that the countries the countries can uh, the UK changed completely. And you know, if I wasn't fly fishing, I, the places that I wouldn't see, I just think about the experiences that I wouldn't have. You know, um, and almost every everybody who I meet is great. You know. I can be in a tidal creek somewhere in Kent and I'll be walking past people, oh, hi, good morning, you know, and I think more people from the city, especially more people from minorities, should be, you know, I think fishing is a very, very good conduit and reason to actually get out and explore the UK in itself. I mean, if you're born in this country, it's your birthright, you know, and I think there are, there are maybe some people harbour preconceptions about what it is like to access these places outside you know, in the outdoors that probably need to be bro- broken down but also many people who live in some of these more remote areas probably need to see people from a r- different range of backgrounds to get used to you know these things you know because even me if i you know, i can be in the mi- in middle of nowhere sometimes and i'll get the odd look and i know that it's not just somebody simply look you know they're not it's not necessarily bad but it's certainly letting me know that i'm a bit different out there and hopefully if more people go out go out into the outdoors and the weather sort of fly rod in their hand, then you won't be viewed as being, you know, not out of place, but different, you know? And uh, fishing is a great way to get people engaged. And as I said, to see what the fly community is doing is, you know, especially some of the companies, it's, it's brilliant, really brilliant. And it's not that alien to fly fishing. I mean, uh, we were talk- we were talking to Alex Clare, who you had on, um, and he's Jewish. I remember us talking about, you know, Jewish flying bliss, and he mentioned that uh, Halford was a Jew. You know? And to think what it was to be a Jewish person in, the, in that era as well, it wasn't a joke. You know? So, yeah, I suppose diversity is uh, not at the heart of my fishing, but not totally at home. So, yeah, I think so I wouldn't mind getting some kind of a project going. Because you know? I feel I can be doing more for more for the sport in terms of getting more people in involved as well because I'm a bit individualistic, a bit selfish. Go out there and do it myself. And I think that, you know, I can be secretive with some spots, but then I think to myself, this perhaps it should be shared with other people, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you think then to bring more minorities in that has to come to youngsters? Or is it encouraging people to come to Walthamstow and give it a try? Where, where do you think and um, how do you think that we can help to encourage people to to enter our world of yeah. uh, fly fishing? All right. All right. There was a guy you had on your podcast. I don't remember who he was. He may have been the person who was designing stuff for uh, Reddington. He was from the north somewhere. I remember that. And Paul he was Richardson. saying, when was it ever the case? Yeah, I think it may have been him, and he was saying that when was it ever the case that you turned up to a lake and saw young, loads of young people? It was always the case where youngsters were like a uh, minority, because I remember when I was a kid, it was mostly older people. I think in a way, fly fishing, it, I'm not saying it suits older people, but certainly it helps to have a lot, you know, the mobility, the the, uh, the independence. So definitely it suits, you know, a lot of people who are perhaps working hard in cities and, and that. But Walthamstow have a get get into fly fishing thing. But I mean, in terms of how to reach people, I I would say as somebody like me, I just have to get off my backside or any, you know, people like Hector as well. We, or there's another guy called Walid. Um, Yeah, I think people like us probably have to do a bit more to get our friends involved and people in our own social circle, you know? Um, yeah, because, you know, you look at um, something Yeva mentioned in her podcast with you, that, you know, you look at fly fishing on social media and, 
it looks young, it looks vibrant, it looks diverse. But when you go, if I go on a guest ticket somewhere on the chalk street, it looks totally different. It's a bit older, you know, more mostly men. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But I do think, you know, we have to think a bit more about the community of tomorrow just as much as today, you know. How, how is the sport going to look tomorrow and the future generations? Because we know that fishing in general, I mean, I don't know if it's going into steady decline or whether, but we know the numbers aren't growing how we'd like, really. So, yeah, we prob- we definitely have to do a lot more as yeah. on an individual level, really, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. The, I think the first... I was going to say, I think the fishing yeah, for schools sorry. is a great... Um, uh, conduit to get kids to plant the seed and I think you're right that uh, and I think you've hit the nail on the head about you know people who are a little bit more mobile have you know and in my day you just get on your bike yeah. with a rod strapped across and, and off you went it, society seems a little different now in that sense and there are lots of other pastimes that kids do so yeah. I kind of get that aspect of it as well but part of me wonders if it is that sort of you know 20 to 30 age Mm. group that has a little bit more as you rightly said the mobility to to get out and perhaps can afford a rod perhaps can afford a a day ticket at Walthamstow it may also come in that and I'm sure places like that and many fisheries do that sort of thing um that kids can go fish for free and that must be a uh, uh, enticement in itself and then that leads yeah. on to things and then you you know what we're like as kids when we're all growing up and then you discover other things and then move away from it but I think when you can come back to it again think actually mm-hmm. and that's where you know my humble way I'm an old fart now so it doesn't really count but people are posting stuff saying look we're doing some different stuff we're doing some cool stuff we're getting out doing that mm-hmm. and that inspires i hope in some tiny minuscule way that i've inspired people younger than me to really go for it and then in turn it will be people like yourself and hector that you mentioned and everyone else that are bringing other people in that are saying and this is you know you've talked about the horrific negatives of social media facebook whatever it may be But there's also those massive positives as well, aren't there? That, you know, guys like yourself are out there doing this, going for strange, regarded as stranger species, and Hector and the Barbel and similar sort of places are actually pushing this. And this is probably reaching people on a conscious level, but possibly on a subconscious one as well. Do you think that's a way of also engaging communities that may not necessarily associate themselves with a a perceived conception of our pastime? Well, um, I'll give you an example. So there's a guy who I talked to, I think street fishing, London, he's uh, something like, he's a lure angler, originally from Germany, Daniele, his name is, and he was saying that in France, he was saying that they're, they're very good at sort of using fish, fishing, particularly, mostly lure fishing as a way of engaging youngsters from the city. There's one, there's an organisation I think called French Touch Fishing or something like that, I think. Uh, the guy who set it up passed away recently. And, and when you look at the pictures, they're all young guys from France, really diverse crowd doing lure fishing, you know. And I think it was actually through lure, lure fish, um, how can I say, through even youth centres they've been doing stuff like that, you know. So, so in France, remember what Daniele was saying that in, in the res- many respects we're quite behind on that, you know, in, in this country. He was saying that in France, and, and to a latter extent Germany, as I said, the lure fishing thing, they, they, they've got it, yeah, they're doing quite a bit on all of that, you know. Um, I mean, the, the thing about fishing, if we talk about that going you know, slowly losing, there are so many other aspects, there are so many other, uh, so motor sports numbers have been down, you know, if we're talking about pop, uh, spectators, you think about nightclubs, you would always think nightclubs would be around for youngsters, but they've been closing in London. So there's a, I think we're going more, in a way, to be an indoorsy culture, you know, computer games, social media. Now, no doubt that everything goes goes in circles, as we saw during COVID, when people couldn't move, more people started to look at fishing, 
you know. But probably, you know, maybe we shouldn't feel so down about losing numbers because it could well just be a case of quality over sort of quantity, you know. When you look at some of the, you know, once again, I'm talking about Instagram, when you look at some of the people who are getting involved in the sport, Amy, Battams, there's a young guy in North Kent called Josh Allen, who's the same as me, you know, loves to, to do things that are differently. When you look at the younger people coming through, and I suppose younger, it's late 20s to your foot. 40s. I mean, I'm 40 this year, so I'm not really that young. But um, when you look at the direction it's going, it looks really positive, you know. But it's what we have already, I just think we could do just that little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And there are some so many fantastic people, you know. So many people have just helped me out along the way, you know. Um, there was a guy called Gary Inwards and Morton Stone who really helped me out, you know. But, Andrew Green sent me fly fishing materials. I used to talk to Theo Pike quite a bit when I was in my second year in fly fishing when I was on the Wandle. There's just so many great people. Jeff Hadley, you know, people are really willing to bend over backwards and help people out. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It is a good community by and large as a whole, isn't it? And like we say, yeah. it's more of a, it is a microcosm. And what we've been talking about, um, pr- the promotion yeah. of fly fishing it sort of segues really nicely towards the videos and was that sort of yes. a, how did that start and was that a natural progression to explore the fishing that you were doing and sharing that in a different way yeah. and, and the films were very good and can you tell us a little bit about them and how they came about and what what you centered on with these as well because i've really enjoyed them i think they've been great but i'd love listeners to get a sense of yeah. um what they were about and how many you've done so far okay so i have a friend his name is matthew i met him on the bus once when i was coming back from fishing and uh, well this is when i was a carp angler and he's he later set up a youtube channel called the uh the London, London City Angler. Because it is, he does quite a bit of fishing in London. Um, carp. He would do a bit of sea fishing, but he was his, his channel was bereft of anything fly fly related. So one day he said, "Look, can I come out and film you?" And uh, I think it was just after I think the first lockdown call season had just opened. So we headed out after my work, and uh, yeah, I caught a few a few chub some dace, a trout as well. I used to get a trout on the dry as well. Nine months later, he had edited it. So I said, Matthew, what's happening? And he said, look, I just don't have time to do it. He gave me the footage and I put it together and I really enjoyed doing it. And uh, one day I just said, Josh, you know, who I mentioned before, Josh Allen, do you, do you mind if I come out and film you? Um, I've always been a real lover of films, always. You know, Stanley Kubrick, Ben Weekly, the Cohen brothers, you know, I've always loved films, you know, and I was a musician myself as well. And I've just found it brings together all the things I love, photography as well. And yeah, I found I just really enjoyed it. Um, I think I, so yeah, I've just been, I've just filmed people who do things similar to me, you know, whether it's Hector on the Wandle fishing for Barbel or Josh Allen in, on some urban stream for Specimen Sharp. I'm putting together something now, which is uh, some of footage I've collected from a uh, tidal creek, mullet, doing mullet fishing in London. Um, but yeah, I just love the process of editing. And I think sometimes as well, well you know, it's an excuse just to, for a bit of retail therapy, you know, getting into something new, buying stuff, doing the research. Um, yeah, uh, I can be a bit of an bit obsessive over things just like my fishing as well so yeah it's 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 another hobby and i really enjoy it but it's definitely about trying to capture people fishing unique places i'm not going out of my way to do it it's just the people they're the people who i kind of you know within my social circle fishing circle so i've done about i think 12 videos now um yeah quite a few of them have been trout uh yeah there've been some people have helped massively along the way as well. I have to say a big thank you to Duncan Philpott. Um, I had a really good time filming him in Sheffield as well. Um, I went to film a young angler as well, only 18, just taking up the sport um, um, in the Midlands. I did one with uh, Skateboard Dave, seeing his uh, really unique approach to um, 
uh, winter cool fish. Yeah, I just really, I really enjoy doing it. I mean, I, I have to take time out of my own fishing to do it as well. And they're not cheap either, you know, the videos. Um, I mean, the filming's free, but when I take into account petrol and traveling up there, and I've done a couple, don't know, I've done a hotel stay. I've done, yeah, I, well, Duncan kindly invite, uh, gave me a bed for one. But yeah, I've actually started to go a bit further out with the films. And as I said, I'm just really enjoying it. I mean, I'd like to try and earn some kind of money off these things, you know, one day, hopefully. Because I think... By nature, I'm a creative person. And I've been stuck in jobs that aren't, that, that probably I'm not suited for, you know, whether it's the kind of job or the people. So, yeah. And so there is something that's a bit more than just going out there and doing it as a hobby. I'd like to try and make some kind of a living in it. It's a bit in, in the wider fishing community, there's a demand for it. I mean, there's lots of competition. But, yeah. Yeah, I just, I just really enjoy capturing it. people as well. Yep, yep. Yeah, and I have to say once again, there's a guy called Ross Tones throwing snow who lets who's let me use some music. Uh, Jason, that jazz musician who let me use mu- music. So I have to say thank you to all the people who started them as well, and all the advice that I've got from people who do do these things for a living as well. And it strikes me that you, the editing is always the stumbling block in this process, and it's absolutely joyous to hear from somebody who loves editing as well. Well, I don't – see, this is the thing. Like, I I watch fly fishing videos. You know, like, I love, say, Rolf Nylander. Storytelling with him is, is great. Then you've got Tight Loops Media. And you look at the quality of tight loops media and you think, how am I not paying for this? It's You're watching something that is, it's TV grade and beyond. And they're doing this for free, you know? Um, yeah, so, I mean, in terms of actual, like, I think I'm influenced by just other directors and, and I've, you know, it's taken me to other places, like studying cinematographers as well. Uh, oh, what's the guy's name? It's from Mexico. Sons of, oh, I've gone and forgotten what the, what the film's called. Yeah, but it's taken me to, you know, learning about colour grading. And once again, I have to say thank you. to so there's a guy called Ben Quinton who did uh, some colour work on the first. So in um, the Mullet article that you published, he did some of the colour work on a photo, on, on one of the photos. And he's, uh, he, he's only taken up fishing since, I think, the lockdown. He's been doing lots of time on the Wandle. And already he's going to places, you know, they're off the beaten track as a flying club. Yeah, Ben Quinton. So he's helped me out a bit, you know, with learning about colour grading. So it's, it's been a, a massive learning process as well. Um, just as fun as what it was when I was getting into fly fishing, you know, looking at videos of Steve Ray Jeff casting and then going down to the park and trying to imitate that. Yeah, so... It's another thing in it, it's another world in itself, but there's nothing, you know, I mean, just to go back over one of your other podcast guests as well. I mean, Susan Scrooper said it best, you know, she's an architect, she has an eye for, you know, very much into aesthetics. I mean, she said it really resonated when she said the fly fishing is an aesthetically pleasing sport in itself. I mean, I remember as a kid, even before I got into fly fishing in North in North Finchley, where I was originally from in North London, just going down to the library and just taking books out and looking at, you know, I just love the look of fly fishing. You know, the way that the colour of the backing contrasting with the fly line, you know, it's just a really beautiful sport to capture, you know. There's always movement as well, whether it's the water or the casting, you know. And it makes me think, I wonder how anyone, you know, can film, how you can make it, anything really static look particularly great. Yeah, I think carp fishing, you have to film it over a long period to make it look quite exciting sometimes, you know, because it can be quite a slow burner. But fly fishing itself is just a, it's just a, you know, really aesthetically pleasing thing to capture, you know. Even if someone's nymphing and not casting, it's just, you know, it's just the colours, the, the range of different species, the environment. So, yeah, so for now, it's just to keep on going out and honing my skills and trying to get better and better, really. 
Nice. Well, yeah. keep them coming. And, uh, you know, like a, it's been interesting talking to you. And you you talk about all aspects of fishing with a, a depth of um, knowledge and a way that you have dived into learning. And it's the, the process. And it seems very similar where you were talking about lighting shades and everything else mm. that you do similar with the, the films. And I, I would encourage people listening to have a look at this. You touched on music. And as you know, you yes. mentioned Alex and we've had, you know, a number of musicians, Steve, yeah. Um, from Hard Fire oh, on as well. Um, and yeah, we've had Paul Jennings, uh, a drummer as well. Yes, Paul Jennings as well, the jazz yeah, drummer yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. And so, drumming yeah. seems I had to when I was re- recording this, actually, yeah. Paul would be listening that I had to pause it at one stage because he was drumming with his hands while we yeah. were talking. So, I'd say, Look, you're gonna have to stop. He said it's really difficult as a drummer, but you're, you're a yeah. drummer too, no, as well, is. aren't you? You must be at least at a third drummer <laughs> that we've had on. Well, I'll say it used to. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, there was a point before, it's even before I got into fly fishing, seriously, when uh, I had I'd gone through quite a bad period in life. And uh, I had the time, you know, I got into drumming and um, I got into it obsessively. I couldn't move out. You know, I didn't want to do anything unless I had four hours worth of practice. But it was the first thing that I had ever done where I had the money and the time to just concentrate and get really good at it. And what it, what it taught me about my own self was that I have a very good ability to, you know, be able to get into something new, pick it up and get quite good at it. I mean, it was, you know, it's the same sort of thing I do with fly fishing, the research knowing what it is to put several hours into getting good, which you're saying you would have, you know, in order to do your, your, your guiding, you know, to get your casting instructors called. It's the same thing. And not everybody, you know, don't, not saying it's a good or a bad thing, but, you know, not everyone has, has, I don't know, how can I say this without sounding bad, but not everybody experiences will go through what it's like to have to really put effort into something in order to get do it to a high standard and have to put in those the sacrifice to get to that level you know you can probably appreciate what is this, when you're a guide what it's like when you really have to take a risk you know and for me if i think what i've done with even fly fishing you know, i've done jobs i probably should, you know it's not probably, i shouldn't have done them you know, because they are, it was part time or it was local, I could fish as much as possible. And drums, it got to the point where it got quite obsessive and excessive, and I burnt myself out. And that's when I got back into carp fishing. Well, I got into carp fishing properly. I mean, I dabbled in the mid 90s, but it was only really in the noughties that I did. And it's the same thing, burnt myself out with carp fishing. Then I got into fly fishing, and I just find it a bit less, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I never, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't stop playing the drums, but the big game changer was when COVID hit. I was playing in a band, I was trying to balance that, you know, with having a chip, with having children and a family and still trying to fish. So then the gigs kept, the gigs just evaporated and then I just made it, you know, I had to make a choice. What is it I prefer doing? And ultimately, it's fishing, it's life fishing. You have to go to a level of obsession sometimes if you if you want to get good at anything in your life, really good at anything. And um, yeah, after I just I wasn't prepared to make that sacrifice with jumping, and I was getting more out of fly fishing than I ever was with drumming. You know, I've come to realise that as a person as well, I'm more self-led. You know, so I don't really. Yeah, I mean, with fly fishing, I can get out there and do it by myself, and I, you know, I can be as good as I can be by myself or with a band. You need other people to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. And what music but, yeah. are you playing? Uh, that was uh, sort of well, I found myself more in sort of like cover bands, like funk, soul. But in terms of the people I was influenced by, it'd be jazz fusion guys. Um, yeah, jazz fusion players. The African American gospel scene—that's just a factory for producing world-class musicians who you'll see performing with most lots of the pop artists. I listen to certain styles of progressive metal, some of the modern stuff. I mean, that's getting into the drums broadened my mind as far as music goes as well. So, you know, I probably wouldn't be listening to Frank Zappa if I didn't 
didn't get into into the drums, you know. But the artist is awesome, jazz. But yeah, in terms of the playing, it was more that I like enjoyed jazz fusion guys. Um, there's a guy called Jeff Picaro played on a lot of the Michael Jackson stuff or the Boss Skaggs thing. Yeah, him, I liked his playing a lot. Steve Gadd. I mean, yeah. I just nice. listen to almost everything now. Nice. It's interesting you touched on the gospel stuff as well and how so much of I, I, soul music's my thing, really. Uh, soul, yeah. Uh, where it's come from there. But there was a, a group, and funnily enough, I bumped into somebody on the river who listened to the podcast, and I'd mentioned a band called The Blackbirds. And I said, yes, you need to listen to this yeah. band. Yeah, um, The Sounds of Blackness. So, do you know them? I've seen them in London. And they uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were involved with them. And the the, the music yeah, they, they were putting out were amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I grew up on all sorts. I mean, that's the thing. My dad had quite... Um, I mean, for a black person, I've had quite... I've had a different upbringing, you know, compared to, say, my wife, who I'd say has had more of a conventional experience for a black person um where my family lived you know they spent time in northern ireland in the 60s in belfast in in the 60s as well um in in time in scotland they my grandfather and we went on from when my heritage is a Ghanaian, but they they lived there you know so into, and it reflects in me my musical tastes you know that i listened to my well my dad was quite cosmopolitan and what he listened to you know I listen to stuff that isn't even English, you know, lots of Turkish music, North African, yeah, you know, Western African stuff. Yeah, I listen to almost everything. Nice, nice. We've talked for well over an hour now, and I wanted to – we've covered so much fascinating ground, but I wanted to get a sense of – I I think I do that – fly fishing for you although you dive deep into it you like it yeah i think as i do that it's non-competitive you do it to yeah for 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 a number of different reasons are you the sort of angler obviously you're making films so you're spending time with people do you like to fish on your own how would you describe yourself as an angler to people uh yeah i prefer to be on my own a lot of the time you know, especially because some of the stuff, um, there is a selfish element. You know, some of the stuff that I do isn't always easy. You know, like, sorry, um, mullet fishing. You know, and I find that you can be going long periods and not catching. And, you know, I prefer to be out of myself and black rather than look to the left and see stuff and mate into a fish and think, oh, no, is it? You know, yeah. especially with something like mullet in some of the areas, they just disappear, you know. But no, I'm, I'm social as well, actually, depending on what, what I'm doing. But yeah, mostly alone. Yeah, mostly alone. But then again, you know, if I get a, uh, a guest ticket on a trout, yeah, it's, and sometimes being with other people, if, you know, it's a good way to learn, especially if you're with people better than yourself. I remember there was a guy who came up, a Greek guy who works with the environment agency. His name's Pericles. And we were on um, the free, the free stretch of the, uh, the land board. And I was with a friend, and you know, I was, I was just doing my usual. At, at that time, I wasn't the best uh, river angler, and just New Zealand style for grading. And I think I'd caught one, and he'd come up behind us. Yeah, you know, and he, uh, yeah, he said he's had about ten. It's like what? So I remember like going sort of cap in hand and just asking what he did. What you know? What um, what was he doing? And he basically gave me and my friend a masterclass. And sometimes fishing with your people are better, more experienced is the best way. Or even like my friend Josh Allen, he hasn't been in fishing that long, really fly fishing, and he's really good. I mean, he came, you know, I showed him a mullet spot, and by the uh, you know a few months later, he's, he's out. Well, we didn't fish together, but he was out catching me, and I was like looking at what he was doing. And he's do you know, whereas I'm, while well, I was fishing with the thin lips, just retrieving, you know. He was fishing static under an indicator, you know. And if I hadn't shown him that 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 spot, you know, he wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. Well, he wouldn't have come up with that method, and then that's it's been working extremely well for me. So, yeah, sometimes fishing with people is good; gives you a different insight. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I'm a loner in general, anyway. But 
Yeah, I'm pretty social, I guess. Bit of everything. Cool. Where is your yeah. dream destination? Where's the one place that, and it can be anywhere in the world, where's the one place you yeah. would love to go cast a fly at something? Uh, a difficult one, though. There's a carp angler by the name of Terry Hearn who's really high, highly regarded and he's never fished it anywhere. He once held the record, actually, a fish called Mary in the mid-90s. He's an iconic figure. But he's never fished anywhere outside of the UK. As far as I'm aware, he's not known for it. I just think there are so many beautiful parts of the UK. It's probably, yeah, I've never caught a salmon or a sea trout. And, yeah, there are just so many beautiful parts of this country that I would like to go to. But I could, there are just so many different species. So, you know, I'd like to go somewhere on the continent and catch an ass. You know, or catch a... Um, well, when you look at that jazz and fly fishing and sort of Rolf Nylander and they're in the Arctic, well, near the Arctic Circle and catching an Arctic char. Oh, this, is just, this is just, you know, too many things to sort of narrow it down. But, yeah. Well, maybe the ideal place is just somewhere in my own backyard, just a tiny little corner that no one else knows about. But I don't know, maybe it has some big chub that I can walk to. I don't, I don't know. Just so much. This was great about fly fishing. So nice. Vulnerable, really. Nice. Like that answer. I like that answer. Yeah, the, the UK does have lots to offer. And yeah, yeah I think that's a, a great answer. Tim, it's been brilliant catching up with you. I know we talk... Oh, um but it's been brilliant having you as a guest on here. Like I said, and it as always happens, the conversation just goes in completely different yeah. directions. And I'm, I'm really pleased that it has. And I'm really thrilled that you are forging a path in our community as a fly angler. Um, and, yeah. you know, it's been great to watch the adventures that you've been on. I thoroughly enjoy the videos and long may they keep coming. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for the articles as well. Um, if people yeah. want to hook, hook up with you on um, social media, how do they find you and find your videos too? Uh, just fly fishing underscore Londoner, both on both Instagram and uh, YouTube. I'd also like to take this time to say, you know, a big thank you to all the people who've helped me in my fly fishing journey. And you, you're one, you're one, uh, one person who I'd say a massive thank you, thank you to Steve Carew from uh, from Pulling Mill, obviously Gary Inwards, uh, Gary Inwards. Oh, the list could go on, really. You know, just Jan from uh, Sean Freeman, who, who he is. Uh, yeah, there's so many people I have to say thank you to. Stuart, uh, South African guy who gave me a 11 foot two weight. Yeah, the, the list is endless, but I have to say a big thank you to all the people who've helped out, continuing to help me out. And I also like, like to think I give my, I give a little bit back to the sport as well, if in my own small way as well. Yeah. So, yeah nice. Thank you. Nice. Tim, it's been great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Everyone, this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this one. And as ever, there will be plenty more. Um, I hope that the magazine has reached you as well, that you're enjoying that. And um, yeah, just keep listening. And if you're enjoying them, please consider subscribing. Thanks so much for listening. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Mm-hmm.